<clears throat> Hello, everyone. How, um, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to start. Um, so I'm uh, my name's Doug or Doug McMaster. I'm from uh, a restaurant in uh, in London called Silo. Um, uh, it's a restaurant that doesn't have a bin. This is more popularly known as a zero waste uh, restaurant. Um, so Silo is now nearly a decade old. Started in uh, in Melbourne, uh, the idea started in in Sydney um, in 2011, um, and uh, in 2012 that's where the the story began. Um, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, certain uh, aspects of the restaurant, uh, quite practically, um, but also quite philosophically. I think that both things are quite important. Um, to work uh, in harmony, uh, and uh, I think that Silo, as a as an idea, as well as a practical example, is a food system of the future. Um, there is many, 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 like countless ideas within that entity that I hope to um, maybe inspire you guys with. Um, uh, you can. Uh, we're the only zero waste restaurant in the world, pretty much. Uh, but I hope that um, with the ideas that we champion and um, popularize, uh, is 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 going to catch on. Um, and within one silo, there are thousands of silos that can be replicated in original and uh, unique interpretations. So uh, I'm going to start the presentation. Um, the most important thing you can do is to keep an open mind. So if we think in the same way as we have done uh, to get to where we are currently, then we're never going to find solutions uh, to the problems we've created. So uh, humans, uh, we're humans, uh, we're on a, a planet, uh, we're alive, the planet is alive, and we've created a food system which is uh, less alive. It's, we're, we're creating processed dead food, and that doesn't make sense. Um, Silo is a, 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 a kind of um, harmonious relationship with nature. That's the ambition. It's certainly not, but that's the ambition. That's where we're going. That's the idea. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if we think in the same way as uh, we've previously done, we're going to keep creating waste. We're going to keep having a bin. We need to think differently. And for that, we need to keep an open mind. Uh, disclaimer, uh, if anyone here um, is going to open a zero waste restaurant or just innovate, uh, prepare to, to suffer. <laughs> prepare to have a really, really hard time because change is hard. We are habitual creatures. We like to do things that is comfortable, creatures of habit, creatures of comfort. And then when you, um, when you don't conform to the way things are, you alienate yourself. The, the, the more innovative, the more alien you become to the kind of um, commercial market and just generally with the way you are, the, the, the more divergent you become, the harder it gets. And that is on multiple levels practically. Um, practically because when you do things differently, there's no guide. No one's there to tell you how to open a zero waste restaurant. It doesn't exist. But more so, you alienate yourself in doing something which your customer, your audience, doesn't understand, so it doesn't feel natural to go to that place. So in multiple ways, doing something divergent or innovative uh, is hard, <laughs> really hard. And I present a bunch of pretty pictures and pretty ideas, but I mustn't, under, I mustn't um, underestimate and mustn't underemphasize how hard it's been to get to this stage. Uh, the, 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 the pretty pictures you're going to see, there's a lot of uh, ugly pictures that don't exist. <laughs> I don't want to take pictures of those things, and you certainly don't want to see them. Um, 
So, <clears throat> and I think Elon Musk, uh, the guy that brought Tesla into the world, he has this hilarious quote um, about innovation. It's um, innovating is like chewing on glass and staring into the abyss, uh, which I can relate to. <laughs> Um, so some fundamental questions. We've got to start with the, the fundamentals. There's a great book called Start With Why. Um, and it's kind of before you um, start innovating something, you re really need to understand on a fundamental level, under <clears throat> on a fundamental level, why you're doing what you're doing. And so you've got to ask these uh, kind of key questions. So, you know, what is zero waste? And that's something we're going to answer today. Uh, deeper, what is waste? How did it get here? And how do we get rid of it? Now, this quote, uh, I'm not overly quotey. There's not that many quotes. Um, but this is a really, really, really important one that um, uh, is from Desmond Tutu. And it's, uh, there comes a point uh, where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're jumping in. This has resonated with me since um, I heard it in a kind of liminal stage of Silo's evolution. And what I've realized about in a, a zero waste food system is that the 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 stream of waste is coming from a, a particular source. And if I try and change that source, I'm going to fail. I need to step outside of that. I need to detach from that supply chain and start anew. I need to stop putting uh, plasters on different problems that exist and prevent those problems, those cuts from existing. Okay, so it's a, a prevention, not a cure. It's a, if it doesn't sink in straight away, don't worry. That quote took me, I was staring at it again and again for years and, you know, really letting it sink in. As mentioned, Silo started in Melbourne in 2012. Um, uh, the United Kingdom was uh, beckoning me back. I had to attend to family responsibilities. Um, I'm going to mention uh, how it started in Melbourne. It was very exciting and didn't really want to leave, but had to come back to the UK um, and was just on this like path. And I, was, I had to follow this path um, and tried to open a restaurant in, in East London, but got laughed at by every investor, every um, landlord, I was talking about this pre-industrial food system and uh, getting laughed at. And uh, I was only 26 when Silo Brighton started. So it was quite young and the ideas were really um, naive um, and kind of absolute, a kind of uh, very young. And I've learned a lot since then and um, a wounded optimist, perhaps, um, but I was very bright eyed in those days and was going into these investment meetings and talking about the future of food and uh, it didn't really add up and it was too radical. You know, the, the thing with a lot of commercial startups and businesses is if you do something too radical, it's like my, me mentioning the disclaimer about change is hard. Yeah, the more radical, the less of a, the, the more of a risk, the less of a, uh, you know, a sound investment. So, yeah, basically couldn't afford London. Uh, and there was this little cute town on the south coast of England called Brighton. Um, and I just went there serendipitously and found this beautiful warehouse. And the owner of the building was just there. And anyway, so we had Bright uh, Silo in Brighton for five years. I had a five year lease before I could like make sense of this idea to then bring it to London, which is the sort of final resting place. Uh, this is the most important person in the world of zero waste. Um, he's called Joost Backer, uh, J-O-O-S-T-B-A-K-K-E-R. So he's Dutch born uh, Aussie dude who is a genius, um, a true bona fide genius that you know, I've maybe met two in my life and he's definitely one of them and certainly the one that set me on this path. Um, he said to me, 
uh, back in uh, like 10 years ago, could you not have a bin? It's just really like profound, abstract, not have a bin? Like, what, what the hell does he mean? But I was so in awe of his, he had a, a building made of waste materials. Um, and it was on the, uh, in, in Sydney, if you know Sydney, the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge, there's this place called the Rocks on the, the quay. And he had this building made of waste materials, like a pop-up, like big as this room sort of building. And it was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It was um, thousands of terracotta pots um, carpeted the walls of the exterior of this building with wild strawberries growing from it. The roof was a, a hive, a beehive and a hive of um, cucumbers hanging over the edges and um, incredible rooftop garden. And then walking into the, re into the, the space, the restaurant, the building, um, there was this kind of mad prophecies written on the walls and the ceiling like some crazy caveman um and barrels people would like sat on these like converted barrels and pipes pouring natural wine and it was just so exciting and loud sort of rock and roll music playing and you know chefs sat down with customers and i was just like from a um, fine dining background i'd worked in the world's best restaurants and hated it absolutely hated it um but I kept doing it and I just didn't know which way to turn. Um, it was just one kitchen after the other was just so unnatural working, you know, 90 hours a week and getting shouted at and the stress and the, the food itself just didn't make sense to me, even though I had a, a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I don't know if that's an expression you're all familiar with, but it, it just basically means like um, I had a, uh, a problem with authority and that was because when I went to school, um, I didn't do very well, uh, like severely dyslexic and have dyscalculia, so not very good at school and was made to you know, feel really dumb. And I hated that feeling and really wanted to fuck you sort of feeling. And so I applied myself to being a chef, which, you know, you don't need any qualifications to be a chef. Anyone can be a chef. You just got to be willing to never have weekends off uh, to get paid really badly um, and to work every night. Um, so if you're willing to do those things, you're qualified. Um, so so I, 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 I did and I worked like a madman, missed my kind of... I don't remember being 18. I was just in a kitchen. I don't remember being 21. I was just in a kitchen um, and just committed. And um, <clears throat> and then working in these world-class restaurants because I was committing, I was like, I had to like, you know, f meet those people that call me dumb and easy to say, that, you know, fuck you, in in a way that didn't make any sense. It was in, all in my head, you know? Um and uh, and then yeah, I found this this guy and this rest. This it was a kind of pop up restaurant that was made of waste, and I was just like, my mind was blown. I, I it was everything that I, I felt comfortable with creativity and innovation and just like doing things differently and um, doing things with a purpose. You know, like if we're gonna do things, if we're gonna work hard, if we're gonna commit, why commit to something we believe in? Surely, and this is certainly what Yost was doing and yeah and then he said could you not have a bin because he in his restaurant made of waste started thinking well it's kind of um hypocritical to have a, a building made of waste but then we're creating it within the building and then I came along at that time and he said could you not have a bin and that has been a question that has been, I've basically dedicated my whole life to answering that question. Uh, just a really, it's not the best snapshot. This was a little cafe in, in Melbourne. So we had this for a year and it was just like a, um, a test of silo. Um, this is in Melbourne. And then you can see it like a flour mill and an oat roller and lots of jars and crates and sort of get an impression of what that looked like. Now we're moving on to, this is Silo Brighton now. This is the warehouse that I found in, in Brighton in um, 2014. And um, I, again, I had this difficult uh, process talking to investors and 
trying to get people on board with this idea of zero waste and the future of food. And again, no, no one, no one would give me money. No one would, no one, everybody said it would fail. Everybody's, even my mum said it would fail. Um, but I was so single-minded and no one, no one could convince me to not do it. Um, uh, and yeah, and so I didn't have any money and had to scavenge the streets of Brighton for, for materials to, to, to build the restaurant because I couldn't afford tables, I couldn't afford chairs, couldn't really afford anything. Um, the, the money that we did invest was uh, <laughs> I managed to convince my mum to remortgage her house to raise thirty thousand pounds, which is nothing, you know, opening a restaurant, thirty thousand pound, opened this restaurant, and this is not the whole picture. There was more to the restaurant, so yeah, it was uh, almost an impossible feat to open a restaurant with that amount of money. But yeah, not by some altruistic, you know, uh, evangelical ideal. But we made the restaurant from waste because I couldn't afford to buy furniture. But that has been one of the most significant um, aspects of Silo and the evolution because what started here was pretty rough around the edges. You know, we had complaints uh, on TripAdvisor, like a, it's like a British, you know, you complain basically about restaurants and uh, lots of trip advisors saying, oh, I got a splinter in my, in my ass. Um, and, you know, it was uh, not... Uh, soft. It was not warm. It was anyway. It was what it was, um, and it was made of waste. Um, and it, it started a process of of thinking, which has led to something quite special. I I think it's quite special, and you're going to see that evolution. This image I like because you can see lots of little ideas uh, that that evolve into what is now. Uh, we do every single day and it's very successful. So the projection, this is, um, which projected the menu and um, saved a lot of paper. Uh, if we needed to change the menu in the middle of service, that was great. You just go onto your laptop and you just say, change, you know, type, type, type. And it just projects the different menu. And it's so great because when you're working with farmers and produce changes and you just change the menu uh, and there was, a couple of times where we'd run out of, I was serving pheasant and uh, halfway through a busy service, you'd stop serving pheasant and then move on to, to venison. And it got quite confusing sometimes and you take over the pheasant or the venison and they're like, pretty sure I ordered pheasant. And I'm like, no, no, it says uh, venison, I promise. <laughs> they're like, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's quite fun. Um, uh, the the flour mill, you can see a little flour mill. That's something very important. That's actually the logo. The outline of that flour mill is the logo. Because the flour mill, um, it represents silo on so many levels. We don't rely on an industrial supply chain. And by industrial supply chain, I mean um, food that has been pre-processed. Um, so you, you think of wholesalers, uh, supermarkets, the food that has been from nature to you has been pre-processed. This is uh, an industrial food model. Now we circumvent that. We go straight to nature. And the flour mill is kind of the most fundamental, you know, we, we eat a lot of bread. Um, to go directly to get wheat means that we have to mill our own flour. So it kind of symbolizes this holistic natural food system, which is, you know, what zero waste really is. Um, and then this uh, T-shirt. So I wanted to serve raw milk because raw milk is natural, you know, right? It tastes better. It's better for us. Uh, this is uh, a good example of... Uh, a, a massive, massive failure. Um, so I thought I was being really clever and like edgy by printing this T-shirt. And uh, basically the environmental health officer said, you cannot serve raw milk. Like, no way, no way. And I was like, 
there must be a way, right? You know, really young, naive, just kind of reckless. And then eventually after like hounding this uh, environmental health officer, she was like, well, it could be a loophole, but you know, e expecting me to like say no way. But she said, if every single customer has a disclaimer that there's a raw milk product, then you're safe, you know, legally you're safe. So I was like, that's great, I'm gonna use that. And then printed a t-shirt, warning, this venue serves raw milk products, consume at your own risk, may cause health and well-being. Um, I thought that was really clever because all of our staff had this t-shirt on. So I didn't need to tell people that it was raw milk, right? Sounds, sounds good, looks good. Um, but there was a, a, a local food critic uh, in Brighton who, a, a bit of a, I don't love the guy, um, but he came into the restaurant and hated us. You know, we were too different. We were like, who are these hipsters? You know, like, what's uh, zero waste? Up? And he just hated us from the start. Anyway, he came in, had food, left, and then uh, a month later, went on live radio and said that he went to hospital because we served him raw milk. He said on live radio that we nearly killed him. So this was a bad idea. <laughs> this is risky, reckless um, creativity. Um, but I still think it was worth showing you in the, in the presentation. Um, it's a bit zoomed in this. Uh, does the tech, is there a... I'm just gonna leave it, he's gone, he's left me. Uh, just a snapshot of uh, the, the, the food. It's, it's important, but so is everything else. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on plates of food. Uh, put one slide in here to give you a snapshot of what the food looks like. N natural, nature, simple, pure, um, I think elegant and creative. Um, but if zero waste or a food system is a tree. This is the leaves of the tree. We're gonna spend more time looking at the, 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 the roots of the tree, the, the, the stem of the tree, the system, because that's what really, I mean, this is um, a manifestation of a very unique supply chain of amazing farmers, a lot of creativity and, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Um, but we're going to focus more on uh, how this came to be. So this is now Silo London. Uh, we opened Silo London two years ago. Uh, we've only been trading for one year, but uh, with COVID. Um, but you can see a, a much kind of uh, greater uh, elegance. It's uh, softer. Uh, there's no complaints on TripAdvisor about splinters in people's bums. Um, this is soft, it's comfortable, um, elegant. Um, and what I like about this, uh, this has gone from a restaurant set up with no money to a restaurant set up with a good amount of money. And a lot of people might say, oh, you need a lot of money to set up a zero waste restaurant. I'm like, no, I proved it. You can do it with ne nearly nothing. You can do it. Um, because there's a lot of ideas. You can spend a lot of money on a restaurant. You can spend a lot of money on a zero waste restaurant, um, but you don't have to. Um, and this is done. Uh, all of the ideas have been realized at their greatest potential because there's a decent investment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's still a restaurant that is made from regenerative and waste materials. The design brief was, I want to have one of London's sexiest restaurants made of waste. Um, you can see this goes back to the picture a little bit earlier on. You can just see a lot of the aspects that was in its infant stage in Brighton and has like realized that you've got the bigger flour mill. You can see it's a bit zoomed in, but the projection up on the top left, um, the, the, the pails um, of dairy where we churn the butter, uh, the plastic bag plates, which I'm going to talk a little about later. Um, so it's much more grown up and evolved. 
but there is no and it, it emphasizes this point that like being sustainable being natural being ethical doesn't mean compromising on luxury or quality this is super high quality but extremely sustainable extremely natural extremely responsible so now we're going to get to the 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 systemic the the how do we not have a bin so this is a, a system um to prevent waste. Um, this is going to be part one. Then part two, we're going to talk about an idea which is looking outside of our system at the waste that exists in the world. So despite having this wonderful, you know, zero waste system, do we ignore the waste that exists or do we embrace it with our, you know, the, the, our approach? So we're basically, um, looking at the waste that exists and innovating that waste. And uh, there's a str strong emphasis on this. Now, the word upcycling is probably the word that you would use to describe this. I don't, I, I like the word upcycling, um, but I wanted to create a new word because I feel like it's something, it's a movement. You'll see by the, the presentation, there's so many very exciting projects using waste to turn it into these precious, delicious things that we need, you know, to survive on Earth. We need these things. But to make them out of waste, that's the, 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 the game-changing moment. And it needs a title, and I call it New Waste. So um, this is part one. Uh, this is the, the, the three pillars of a zero waste food system. So if you have a bakery, a cafe, a, a canteen, anywhere in the world, you can follow these three uh, principles and not have a bin. There's a lot of detail within these pillars, but that is essentially this trifecta of zero waste. So dealing directly, I mentioned that we dodging an industrial supply chain because that's where waste exists. That's where plastic and polystyrene and pollution exists. If you trade directly with nature, those things stop existing, you know? Um, so direct trade is pretty much the biggest, most fundamental aspect of zero waste. But as a... Um, uh, um, a byproduct of working directly with farmers, the food is pre-processed. So you have to have this whole food preparation. If you get wheat from a field, it's not going to magically turn into flour. You need to whole food prepare wheat and churn butter. And, you know, if it's coming from a cow, you have to churn the butter or make... Um, so there is this whole food preparation uh, that is involved with direct trade. And then finally, composting. So by this point, uh, you're dealing directly with nature and it's coming in in reusable vessels, which we'll talk about. It's coming into your restaurant. You're making your butter and you're, you're milling your flour. But then everything within that restaurant or that you know cafe or whatever you choose to do is natural. It's from nature. So you don't need a bin, right? It's therefore only natural waste which can be composted, which is inevitable. You know, you're not going to eat eggshells or uh, bones, food that falls on the floor. So inevitably, you need to close uh, the loop and compost all that exists after that point. Uh, so direct trade. So <laughs> done this little illustration. I like to draw map out these systems in my head so I can clearly see. Um, these are the origins. This is the nature that I'm talking about. Uh, you've got the um, um, the, 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 the sea, um, exotic goods coming on a, on a ship because um, we love chocolate and coffee and rum and things that are not local to London. And how do you do that directly? You work with a bunch of sailors um, who import food directly. Um, we're going to talk about that. Uh, wild food, of course, farmed food, of course, dairy, and then this is um, rewilding. So that's an interesting aspect outside of agriculture. Um, that where we where we uh, where we get meat from, and uh, yeah, so that that's where food comes from. It comes from these people, and it's just an observation which is important. 
to talk about um, nature, to talk about agriculture. We all know organic. Organic is good. It's important. There's the certification, and then there's the word itself. The word, you know, organic is fundamentally like natural. Um, and that's really good and really important. But if sustainability was a pie, organic would be like 10%, maybe. The word regenerative is much, much more prominent. Now, there isn't, to my knowledge, a, a regenerative certification. It's an idea. It's a principle. It's fundamentally, if we uh, humans uh, are on this planet and we're taking uh, its resources, we're taking, pillaging nature, if we're taking things from it, we and don't give it anything back, then we'll have no more resources. We will have no more food. Um, had a really interesting conversation just before this presentation about uh, 2050. There's going to be 56. I can't remember the figure now, but it was pretty harrowing. Um, now, this is industrialism. What industrialism is, again, this machine metaphor, it's taking, 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 take from nature, take its resources, take its energy, take its nutrients from its soil and give us what we want when we want. You know, we're stealing from nature and not giving it anything back. Um, famous chef called Dan Barber has a, 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 an analogy. He's, he calls it the bank account idea. So um, if you have a bank account and, you keep, and you've got an amount of money in there and you just take and take and take, there'll be no money left. We have to reinvest uh, in the bank account to have more money to survive. And it's exactly the same with nature. It has a limited amount of resources and we've just been stealing from it. We need to reinvest to survive. There is no planet B. And that, unfortunately, is not that far away. Um, the, the resource is drying up. We've already used a fifth of the world's healthy topsoil, which will take a thousand years to regenerate. This is not good. This is scary. Um, we need to look at everything we do, every action, every um, purchase as, um, is this regenerative? That sounds maybe a little bit abstract. Um, but I think in the future, that term, that idea will be um, considered on a more kind of day-to-day uh, -day level. Uh, looking at the materials we work with in silo, food, cardboard, glass, it's not mentioned, I mentioned this trifecta, this zero waste thing. Glass wasn't mentioned, so it deserves its own category because these two things, I'm just wondering if this is a pointy thing. No. Sometimes it's like a red dot. Oh, no, it's not that. Anyway, uh, food and cardboard are from nature. They will compost back into nature and feed nature. Uh, but glass, uh, that you know, that's something that we require in silo. I would love to get all of my wine in kegs, you know, like in Australia. Uh, I described this guy, Yoast, and the greenhouse. Um, but in London, the supply chain of uh, natural wine is very, very limited, certainly not enough to populate a, a nice wine list. So we are getting wine from, from, from Europe and to work in a reusable way is not going to happen. I, you know, maybe in 10 years, maybe. So single use glass is uh, an inevitable material that enters the space. This is a, a very unique thing to, 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 to point out, um, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. These percentages are basically a uh, you know, total percentage of probably of all the things that come through the front door. Probably 70 percent by weight is food and maybe five to 10 percent. We do buy a lot of wine and that's in a, in a cardboard box um, and it is just from wine. Like cardboard and glass is just wine. Everything else is reusable. And then alien waste. Um, we're going to talk about this in a, in a, in a further slide. Um, <clears throat> but there, it's understanding the materials within your space so you can find solutions. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> we don't have the tech guy either. <laughs> this is not good. What have I done? I think it's dead. I think... Hold on. Bugger. 
Maybe if I pull that out. I'm not good with technology. Uh, do you uh just reset the presentation? Reset it. Right. Oh, it's definitely your laptop. Mm -hmm. Taking a brief break. How's okay. <laughs> it working? Yeah. And I think there is a I think this is What's that? I think there's a monkey. No, uh, that's what I thought. I think it's just dead. He was charging it before and then I think it's dead. Anyway, I can manually do it. I think, okay. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. All right, the show will go on. Um, the suppliers, so having this intimate relationship with people that grow food defines our menu. It defines, for me, it's, what these people do, the people that grow food, is there's not enough respect and love for these people. The, the f imagine, I just think it's so important. The amount of money in certain industries is, is grossly um, warped. And the way we spend money in the world, I think, is, is you know, the way we spend so much money on things that are not as important as food. And I think in, in the UK, for instance, the the average spend on food is like 10% of our, what we earn. In countries like France, it's more like 50%, and I like this much more. Food is precious. Food is important. And the relationship we have with these people has really defined uh, restaurant and working with these people, having this face-to-face -face relationship, not only do we get fresher, better food, but we uh, integrate our menu with nature because we have this communication. Whereas where you deal with an industrial supply chain, you just have a list of ingredients on a on a sheet. And what happens is in a wholesale market, which is 99% of how food comes into cities, um, the wholesale market doesn't know the demand. It can sort of predict it. And so there is this supply chain with all these farms, and they're buying in random amounts of food, more than enough, always more than enough. So much food comes into these big wholesale markets, and then they trade you know, with all this kind of produce in their warehouses, they trade with, with chefs and with, with supermarkets and whatever. And then the problem with that is they don't want to <clears throat> lose money. So there's always an, a massive abundance of food that's in these warehouses that's essentially going to die. And if you don't order it, if it's not ordered, it gets wasted. Again, this is, to me, negligence. This is a terrible, broken system that wastes so much food. This is why there is so much food waste in the world, because it is a disconnected uh, food system. Whereas what we have with these people um, is an exact way of ordering food from the farms that, you know, it's a very clear relationship. You know, we go to the farms a lot and we know what's growing. We know what's for instance, not selling, and we can then maximize that onto our menus and cook what's what's growing, what's living, and there's 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 no waste in that supply chain because it's it's grown and then served to order, um, and uh, and yeah, just the respect for nature changes. What happens within an industrial supply chain is that when we disconnect from food. When we disconnect from nature, you know, in these big urban environments where we don't know these people, then why do we care if it gets wasted? It's by, it's by having this relationship with these people and the, the, what they do, what they believe in, what they fight for, why they get up at five in the morning. Then food is precious. And then the thought of throwing away and discarding that food is just, it, it makes no sense. But industrialism, when you have a detached supply chain, when you go to a supermarket, it means nothing to you. You don't know who's grown it. There's no relationship. And so it becomes a commodity and you can dispense of it. 
who cares? There's no zero waste police. You know, you're not going to get fined for throwing things away. And that's, that's, that's industrialism. Uh, Oscar and Abby have a farm 35 minutes away from the restaurant where all the oil and all the wheat comes from. Um, I've put this, uh, the Phil crew, that should say, um, picture in because it goes beyond food. We need to clean the restaurant, but we have close personal relationships with everything that comes through the front door, everything. And cleaning products are as, you know, as important as food, you could argue. Um, by knowing these people, we can work together to innovate and to make um, cleaning zero waste. Um, um, Howard here delivers all of the um, products in an electric vehicle. Um, this, uh, I, I forget this guy's name. Uh, this guy's Phil, he's the, the founder of the business. And this is the scientist, he's the mad scientist that makes these um, uh, sustainable environmental cleaning products that, um, that you'll see is delivered in reusable vessels. But it's having that direct relationship which it, it makes innovation so much quicker and easier and immediate. Um, vegetables come in crates, reusable crates. Fish comes in these reusable fish boxes. Milk and cream comes in a stainless steel pail. Um, kegs of specialist drinks like ebulis and kombucha, uh, kefir, and poured from a tap. These are the cleaning products. Um, we have these, we have five of these barrels, which is 200 liters. And uh, Howard, the guy on the right, he just comes in with this kind of like, ghost buster like backpack and these like fuel pumps like two of them and just fills them up and it's just amazing and it's totally zero waste there's no single use uh, materials anywhere in the whole supply chain um uh, this is uh the the, the tres hombres this is one of five boats in a fleet that um, under the banner of Fair Transport, it's a company called Fair Transport, and basically they all have different, the different boats have different routes around the world. Um, some going, this is the biggest boat, and this goes really far. I think it's even sailed to Australia. Um, but then the smaller boats uh, kind of go across Europe from like Portugal, delivering almonds um, to, to Silo. And um, uh, the I've got a basically one of the boats just a month ago came to the, uh, down the Thames River uh, to St Catherine's Dock. Um, it was a small boat called the the Gallant, a French boat, and delivered um, yeah loads and loads of different things for Silo. And then it sailed up the canal, and Silo is located on a canal, and the 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 produce came all the way from Colombia to Silo's front door on water, uh, which was, yeah, it's quite amazing. Whole food preparation. So this is kind of self-explanatory. And uh, we're milling flour to make bread. Um, we're making yogurt and creme fraiche, you know, in, in pans like this. To, uh, yogurt and creme fraiche and processed dairy always comes in single-use plastics. So we make it ourselves. Butter, we churn. Uh, if we're getting a whole ingredient, we're processing it and maximizing all of it. All the guts uh, get turned to gold. Um, this is all of our waste bread. Um, so when there's waste bread, we freeze it until there's enough to make a big batch of, uh, of Marmite. This is a brand new uh, thing on our menu. We basically make Marmite. I don't know if you're all familiar with Marmite, but yeah, it's that very dark, savory, syrupy thing that some people hate, some people love. Um, but we make it by soaking bread, uh, as you've just seen there, in water um, for, for a day or to three days if you want more sour flavors, leaving it at room temperature. And then we squeeze that out and then just reduce it. All the natural sugars and flavors from the bread uh, get going into the water and then yeah, reduce into this incredible uh, like Marmite syrup. This is the most important ingredient in Silo. Uh, it's koji. So koji is a cultivated fungus. So we purposefully grow mold on grains. This is sprouted buckwheat. Um, so we're growing uh, aspergillus orizae, which is a spore, the name of a spore. 
and we're, we're, we're growing that because it has magical properties uh, that convert, basically convert waste into, into gold, into absolute delicious flavors that um, are better than the primary ingredient itself. So you're using the byproducts of the waste from these, these you know, ingredients and the flavors that can be achieved with the help of koji are spectacular. I call this like the golden gateway to zero waste. The amount of waste we save like internally processing the whole food. This upcycles all of the things that we cannot put on the plate. So things like buttermilk or whey and you know you can use these things in little tokenistic ways but not the amount we create. We churn a lot of butter and we have liters or gallons of buttermilk. You know what do you do with all that buttermilk, there's certainly not enough space on the menu for it. So these barrels are above the restaurant. Um, you can see the restaurant down there. And it's just big, massive barrels of all of our waste that has koji and salt in it. And then it goes through this enzymatic um, metamorphosis throughout months and sometimes years. And then we strain it off and you've got the kind of solids, you know, cheese rinds or uh, the, the koji itself. And then this is what we call liquid gold. Um, and there's like the different pressings of the liquid gold. So like virgin press and then there's the, the solids. And then um, we don't like to waste things, obviously. So what do you do? So this is essentially we need butter. So we get cream from a cow and then we realize oh we have to now deal with um, buttermilk so then we, we we then turn that into liquid gold but then there's a byproduct from that so it's just this series of events which don't exist in all the restaurants and then we're constantly trying to like close the loop on all these extra things that other restaurants wouldn't need to deal with so the solids of that it's like what do you do with that um, we dry the solids, we blend it with tapioca and we dry it to these big sheets and then they get fried into what's like a, in England, they're called quavers. It's like a fluffy puffed crisp. You know, you get puffed rice. It's like a puffed um, quaver, we call them. And then we, we fry bits of that into these shapes. And then this particular one is a, a, a snack served at Silo. It's one of the most popular dishes, but it's the waste of the waste of the waste. Um, and it's one of the most popular dishes, and it is amazing how that happens. Uh, they're the most delicious things, which is odd, very, very odd. And there's some we great frozen goat's cheese over that, and there's a sea buckthorn syrup. And then finally, compost. This is kind of closing the loop on all those natural materials. Uh, I explained before, the food and the, the, the cardboard essentially comes compost, and that goes back into, into, into nature. Uh, this is a machine that we had in Brighton. We don't have this machine anymore. It processes up to 60 kilos of organic waste a day. We're doing 20 kilos of organic wa waste a week. So this is overkill. We don't need that power, uh, which is a good problem. You know, it's, it's a very innovative machine. Works like a human stomach, has microbes and heat and it basically breaks down food waste into compost in one day. It's a spectacular machine. Um, and if you have a hotel or a big restaurant or a brasserie or something, this would be really good. This would be really good. But it was overkill for, for Silo London. A uh, little compost shop, uh, going back to nature to grow food. So to, this is a shame that this is um, zoomed in. So this is an illustration to represent that trifecta, those three things. Um, so direct trade. So there's the farmers and the foragers and the you know, dairy farmer with the pails and whatnot. Um, that food comes into spaces, you know, chefs or, 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 or regular consumers. This is an idea on zero waste, of course. Um, and then you have this whole food preparation you maximize those resources, you know, in the ways described, you know, you closing the loop on all of those byproducts and you're, you're maximizing the resources to minimize the amount of compost. But then event, uh, inevitably that compost will exist, which goes back to nature and it works because they come in 
directly to the restaurant. So when they come, they can take the compost away. Um, so I need to be honest with you all. <laughs> I need to tell you, a tr uh, I, I, I lied to you. I lied to you at the beginning when I said we don't have a bin. We do have a bin. Um, we call the waste in that bin alien waste. So this is, I say 1%, but it's more like 0.001%, but we do have a bin. It's the bin of shame. Uh, it exists. Uh, and once upon a time, I was just like desperately trying to like, ah, why, is, why does this exist? And every, in Brighton, every Saturday night, I would make everybody pick out the alien waste bin and say, why is this here? Why is this here? Why is this here? Because in theory, everything is designed out of the system. It shouldn't be here. It's an, it's, if Silo was a planet, it would be an alien on that planet. It's not meant to be in this system. Somehow perpetrated the system. Somehow found its way in. Doesn't exist here, and that's why we've called it alien waste. But that doesn't mean... Uh, the reason I want to be honest and tell you we have a bin is this isn't perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. Silo is far from perfect. Again, I show you this pretty slideshow. Like, we've still got a long way to go. We make mistakes. We are human and we make errors. Um, but then I had an idea, you know, in, in my Saturday night of shame looking at this waste. Um, I was like, it was this, I don't know what triggered, but it was this emotional trigger that made me like, somebody said something, I can't remember what it was, but somebody basically said, you should be proud of this. You should be proud that you're pulling your hair out on a Saturday night over a few, you know, uh, Sharpie pens and, 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 and tiny bits of um, glitter that a customer left or whatever. Like, um, that's an amazing thing that you're getting stressed about, such tiny detail. I was like, oh yeah, that is quite good. Um, and then I, flipped my approach and like now I'm like really proud of this alien waste and so much so that I even thought what if we were to turn that waste because essentially it's bits and bobs of random crap that I can't really upcycle um, but maybe we could turn it into an artwork and so the idea and it doesn't exist yet but it's gonna uh, is we're gonna create a uh, the word human error in individual letters, in a structure, like a, a cage basically, shaped into the words, into the letters, human error. I don't know where it's gonna go. In my mind, it's gonna sit above the canal outside silo, spotlit. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but um, the cage human error will be a cage for our alien waste. And again, in my head, I was thinking it's going to be like a live feed on the, on the you go on the website and you could just watch the waste. Um, like a, a kind of big brother is watching you sort of waste observation artwork. Um, but the thing that I like, I think it's quite poetic is that the idea is that that artwork will never, ever be complete. If it's completed, I'll not be doing my job very well. <laughs> But yeah, the idea is to to uh, turn that 1% or the alien waste into something else, something that has a different value. Uh, this is a, a kind of half alien waste. This is alien waste. Uh, this is not alien waste, but it's something that there's a lot of people doing a lot of cool things with cork. The problem with cork, again, it's all about the wine bottles. That's where all of our problems are. The cardboard, the glass, the cork, the alien waste, all from wine. Um, so if any of you want to innovate zero waste, that's an industry to innovate. Um, cork, it's uh, bound together with a non-natural resin. So it's not, not compostable and it's not uh, recyclable. Um, but there's always a way of turning it into something brilliant. I just haven't figured it out yet. So again, you're welcome. You can go and innovate and change the world. Um, anyone that's interested in business might be thinking like, how do you do all of that? And how does that make sense? Essentially, your staff costs go up, but your ingredient costs go really down because you're not paying that industrial supply chain. 
the, the, the middleman, the people within that supply chain, the drivers and the bloody, all the people involved aren't getting paid in a pre-industrial food system. So food is cheaper. The farmer gets paid more. The chefs spend less. Um, so yeah, the ingredient cost comes down and that is the kind of general building costs are fixed, you know, in most restaurants, obviously this is all hypothetical, like different for everyone everywhere in the world, but essentially your building costs are a fixed cost. It's these two, the relationship between these two, which radically different in silo or a zero waste system. Um, so we talked about, this is uh, what we've talked about, this prevention. This is the sort of Desmond Tutu quote, you know, preventing waste. And then looking at the waste that does exist and will continue to exist long after we're all dead. Like waste is going to exist and we need to do something. We need to clean it up. And so this is the new waste. Materials reborn, if you want to think about it differently. The, within the silo, you've got the natural regenerative materials, the, the cork floor you might have seen, and um, this is mycelium, um, which is a, like the koji. It's a fungus that's grown, but it's a, it can be used to make furniture. Um, but then the new waste is like looking at upcycling plastic, upcycling glass, even seaweed. There's going to be more examples. The cork floors, regenerative cork. Again, regenerative isn't just regenerative farming. Well, that is farming, but it's not just food. It's a cork tree. You're not killing the tree. You're taking from it and letting it regenerate. Um, uh, there's sheep's wool on the ceiling. You can't see, but sheep's wool, again, is a regenerative example of regenerative material. You're not killing the sheep. You're shearing it and then using it for things that we need, whereas all the other materials are made of waste. This is the, 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 the mycelium, this furniture down here. Um, so this is a fungus grown into furniture. Those uh, stools, they're like toadstools, grow in seven days. And it's grown on waste beer grains. So waste beer grains are a perfect substrate because they've got the starches and sugars that, that mycelium feeds on. And then it's basically grown into a, into a shape and then baked in this big oven. And then furniture. <laughs> you can throw it on the compost heap if you don't like it and it will biodegrade like that and it's grown. Um, so that's kind of combination of um, regenerative and waste materials. Um, there's a little bit more of a close-up of the mycelium. It's really spectacular. Um, the wine menu or the drinks menu, there's so many options. You don't want to put that on the projector that's too much information but this is printed on upcycled coffee cup paper so paper that is upcycled into um sorry coffee cups that are upcycled into paper beautiful fine paper that's made from coffee cups um so we make cups there's now we just just opened a pottery above silo and when we make something and it breaks we can glue it together with gold it's an idea in in japan uh, called kitsugi and it's embracing that which is broken uh, there's a lot of things that break and we shouldn't look at it as waste instead embrace um regenerative cups um this is um, uh, back in Brighton when I couldn't afford plates. Um, I went to a degree show with all these art students and there was a student, who Louise, who made a sculpture out of waste plastic. And I said to Louise, could you make plates out of waste plastic? And uh, you, these were the original plastic bag plates. Um, so she literally found plastic bags on the street, cleaned them, um, processed them, sorted them, melted them into molds um, and then dipped them in bioresin to make them food safe. But if you can turn a plastic bag into something as functional as a plate and there's something interesting there, there's something as a principle, um, uh, uh, yeah, a creative thing. But the problem is they're not that nice. They're, it's okay. Um, but this is seven years ago and everyone was just like, that's gross. And that's, that's like <laughs> such a bad idea. Um, but I thought it was a great idea and perse persevered. Now persevering, you remember change is hard. You've got to persevere. Like 
the reason zero waste restaurants don't exist is because they're really hard. And I'm just the, the right kind of lunatic to persevere, to bring it to existence. And like, I just have this kind of like feeling that something's a good idea, it's a feeling. And I don't care who tells me it's a bad idea, I persevere and it gets better and better and better. And then eventually we have these, what I would think of as each plate is just like a piece of art. And now the, this is the stack we have in London and each one is just magnificent. And it's durable, it's compressed to such a high level, it's cut clean, it's, lam it's um, natural bioresin, it's safe, it'll last forever. It can, if it, if it does get like cut into or scuffed, it can be um, um, uh, like cleaned up again very easily. So it keeps going and going and going and going forever. It's a truly a, a, a magnificent metamorphosis of a plastic bag. So that's what I like. You know, you're turning something with no value into something with high value. You know, the greater the increase of value, the more spectacular the, the, the new waste. This is uh, a chart that's uh, a relationship. Whenever you're upcycling something, whenever you're creating, even in the kitchen or with materials, it's a relationship between value and energy. So you could spend 10 hours making a, a miso from carrot tops um, and then serve it to two people. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you don't spend 10 hours making a carrot top miso for two people. That doesn't make sense. So everything that you do, you need to consider the relationship between how valuable is this thing that I'm going to process um, and how much time is it going to cost me. And so you can plot these things like I've just done here to understand if it's worth doing. Um, some examples up here we're going to talk about the, the glass porcelain and the Thames River chef's knife coming up. Um, so this guy, Tim, um, is a, a very dear friend of mine. Uh, he saw the plastic bag plates on Instagram. He lives on a canal boat and he had this cable reel that he like fished out of the canal and he's a knife maker and he saw the plastic bag plates and wondered if he could turn a cable reel into a chef's knife using the plastic that was floating outside of his house into the handle. So on the right, you can see the cable reel. You can see the, the, the ribs of that cable reel going into a furnace. And you can see shredded plastic, much like the plastic bag plates. And then you can see a magnificent 27-inch bloody sword. Um, and again, emphasizing what you can do with waste with the right amount of determination, creativity, and kind of intelligence, depending on what you're doing. Um, I just think it's amazing. Uh, we've talked about this uh, enigma within this uh, zero waste system is glass. So glass, if a glass bottle goes to landfill, it'll take a thousand years to break down and probably won't even do it then. Glass extracting silica sand from the earth is extremely inefficient for energy use. It's extremely damaging to the environment. They're like exploding uh, parts of like the desert to like extract silica sand. Um, and then it gets used once and then goes, it's amazing when you look at the statistics of glass recycling, it's so bad. <laughs> I say amazing, I mean terrible. Um, so much goes to landfill, so much, if you think about somebody drunk walking through a park, having a beer, and he's not gonna think about recycling. So it goes into general waste or onto the street or it gets broken. And those things mean that it don't, doesn't get recycled. So it goes to landfill and just doesn't break down. This is a big, big problem and something that as being silo, I want to take responsibility for because I know that it's not right. It's not a closed loop. And that's my true goal in silo. Um, we uh, have this process here. It should say things that we need. So the general principle with byproducts coming into silo, things that are necessary, but then not edible. Um, Food can be, uh, waste can be compost, so that closes that loop. But glass, how do we close that loop? 
So the idea is simply to take responsibility, to process it into things that we need. There's a lot of things you need as a restaurateur. You need crockery and plates and tiles, and that's what the idea is. So I imported, I spent about 10 hours going deep into the internet, into a dark hole of glass crushers, and found this particular one in New Zealand. And this is very unique. There's a distinction between this and every other glass crusher. This one grinds the glass into um, fine sand that we can then, because of a consistent particle size, we can melt it consistently into things that we need. So I did a crowdfunding, this is in Brighton, to import uh, this machine and, uh, and, and basically we're crushing it to then give to the pottery, which is now upstairs, to melt it into things that we need. Here you can see um, different tiles that we've made, different clear glass to green glass and gradients in between. This machine is uh, standard. This is an addition in potteries. You get them all over. Uh, basically, in that thing there, it crushes clay into like fine powder. So we took that idea or that machine and put the glass sand into it and had glass powder. So then it would melt not at 1,000 degrees, but 600 degrees, saving energy and creating a much smoother, like an eggshell, consistency of the glass, again, to make different things that we need. Um, so this is a, uh, a scourer, that is a single-use scourer. Now, some, we're now collecting these because this can be turned into an oxide. So in the pottery upstairs, he buys in these pots of oxide to, this was basically stained gray with an oxide but then we're now saving them to turn into an oxide to go into the glass porcelain. So I present this as an interconnected example of how these materials can work together. Uh, plates made from glass, lights made of glass, um, the little anomaly in my presentation, I'm skipping back to the knives. Um, the, this is Tim again in silo, and this particular blade, this continues the knives. Um, the one that I showed you earlier was from about two years ago with a cable reel when I first met Tim. This is uh, taken a month ago, this picture. Now this blade uh, takes the idea a whole other step further. That uh, cable reel was about 30% of the blade. Now I said to Tim, in Hackney Wick, it's a bit of a party, party place, and there are these uh, stainless steel gas cartridges where people do balloons. You know, like they fill and then do balloons, which is like a party drug. And there's thousands of these oxide cartridges all over Hackney Wick, like outside of Silo, thousands of them. And I said to Tim, can you make that into a knife? I'm um, sorry, let's get through that. Anomaly, yeah, here we are. So these, this is me on a Saturday morning after a, like a crazy Friday night in Hackney Wick, collecting these cartridges and pff, I could make a thousand knives. There's just like constant supply of, of, of these in Hackney Wick. Um, so yeah, I collected them all. And uh, as you can see, um, uh, the, the, there's basically 10 cartridges is 99, no, sorry, 98% of the, the blade. So the very, very tip, this isn't high enough quality. So the very, very tip is like a high quality steel, just to make it a really high quality knife. But 98% of the blade, which runs into the handle, is made from 10 of those cartridges. And this is a plumbing pipe from, you know, in plumbing you get blue pipes uh, from the waste, from the restaurant. So this knife is literally made from the waste around silo. Um, and it's just, to me, I think it's just a really spectacular example of what you can do if you really em embrace the idea of new waste. And to sum up, waste is a failure of the imagination. Waste exists from industrialism. Uh, it is, you know, we have these 
hidden landfills and hidden bins. It's all hidden so we don't have to feel guilty about the waste, but it exists and it exists because we haven't had enough uh, imagination. We haven't committed, we haven't turned into the waste and committed to finding solutions. Um, we're coming to the end of the presentation here. Um, can't quite see. Um, but essentially, this is an industrial supply chain. Everything comes from nature, and it's a linear progression to landfill. It's a linear system, whereas what we're trying to do is go from nature to nature. We're closing the loop on those resources, and with certain exceptions, such as the glass and the alien waste uh, artwork. Um, so to, to kind of conclude the, the, the presentation, um, what is waste? Well, it, it, we have created waste. So we have created industrialism as a system to provide prosperity to the human race. You know, and it's not inherently evil. Industrialism is a word for scale. It's just scale. It's not evil. Um, it's, it's done a lot of amazing things. If you think about industrialism in like transportation and flying to the moon and, you know, healthcare and medicine and, you know, none of that would be possible without industrialism. It's not evil, but the way in which we've harnessed it for our food systems doesn't make sense. Um, we are living creatures uh, on a living planet and we need to work in harmony with that. Um, industrialis industrialism is processed dead food um, and that is what waste is. If you think about nature, if you think about a jungle, there is no bin in the jungle. You know, it's a fully closed loop and it's only us that have created the bin. Now, I have a theory, <laughs> actually, a famous mushroom scientist has a theory. It's called Paul Stamets. He believes that as hunter-gatherers, once upon a time, um, thousands and thousands of years ago, we were gathering for food, seeds and nuts, and we started picking psilocybin, or magic mushrooms. And there is evidence that this is a very plausible idea, that because of... Um, the, the, the eating of uh, magic mushrooms, we developed a, uh, a kind of abstract imagination. So no other species other than humans has abstract thoughts. Now, animals have creativity, but not, you know, uh, dogs don't go to art galleries, you know, lions don't listen to like emo music. That is, a human thing and it's an amazing thing that we have this abstract thought you know we create art and we create all these amazing things but we also create waste and that is unique to humans uh, how did it get there there you go human imagination again doesn't exist outside of the human realm and how do we get rid of it ironically it's with our imaginations it's the only way to design it out of the world we've designed it in we need to design it out um, just another way of looking at it. I think it's a simple um, zero waste. It's just a system with no loose ends. Every single material that we um, connect with, we can close the loop on everything in all the ways that I've uh, pre presented in this, in this talk. But um, uh, this is unfortunately not quite the reality of silo. You know, if we have a, an oven that eventually breaks, that's not a closed loop. Um, again, owning up to the, the imperfection of, of this very noble idea. Um, but aspirationally, we can aspire to um, make the world zero waste with this principle. Um, the, book, the, the book, The Zero Waste Blueprint, exists. And um, all the things I've talked about are in the book and a lot more. It goes deep. Um, just started a cooking school. Uh, it's not going very well. Um, I, uh, the head chef, uh, I have a head chef in Silo who, who moved on to, to, to the next project. So I'm now back in the kitchen all the time and then started this cooking school and stopped the cooking school. And it wasn't that, it was quite good, but not that good. Um, but uh, I am planning on making it amazing. 
you know, things aren't easy in life. Uh, the more radical, the more innovative, the harder. And if I've learned one thing is to persevere because one day it will get good. Um, and um, that's the, uh, the end of the presentation. So um, oh, I'll take a deep breath. Uh, and uh, does anyone, I hope people have some questions lined up because that would be a nice, uh, nice way to, to, to end this session. No, Noah, you've got a question. <laughs> So there's a lass called Noah here who uh, previously worked at Silo. Uh, she's from Zurich and uh, she's in the front row. Uh, so I'm picking on Noah. Uh, <laughs> hit me. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? When, when are you going to open Silo in Zurich? Um, 2022. <laughs> Noah's going to be the head chef. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. <laughs> That's what I think. It's very hard. Um, no, uh, yeah, it's difficult. So basically, in a really quick nutshell, the materials, this is, again, aspirational. This is what needs to happen. It doesn't happen. It needs to happen. The materials created need to be created regeneratively. So natural materials um, created with green energy, uh, delivered green energy. It comes in, it's made, it's manufactured in, in uh, biodegradable circumstances. Um, it then goes into a system that accommodates those biodegradable circumstances, which isn't the case. There's a lot of biodegradable materials, but there is no way of processing them. You need to heat treat or, or mechanically shred those biodegradable materials for them to biodegrade. <laughs> but that doesn't happen. And it, unfortunately for big companies that want to appear green, they have all this biodegradable stuff, but then it goes into landfill, which serves no purpose but essentially in theory it needs to be produced regeneratively you know like the cork uh, uh, pa paper it could be the pulp from one regenerative system anyway it comes regeneratively um, green transport uh, comes into environments where um, there is the right systems in place for that to effectively biodegrade and go back into nature essentially so that's what needs to happen but that's not what's happening there's a great surge in um, the materials, the actual materials, but not the system, because people's consciences are clean when they're using biodegradable, because no one really questions what happens next. But that's the dirty truth of biodegradable materials. Pleasure. Uh, I think 5% uh, come for this, 95% uh, come for the food. Um, and something that I didn't mention, but it's always been a the, the priority in everything we do. Make it nice, make it delicious, make it beautiful, make it comfortable. Um, yeah, like if we can compete with other restaurants by serving food that's as good or better than, then we can compete. If it's like not good, but amazingly sustainable, people won't come. Some will, 5% will, because they believe in like, what the mission is. But if it's not delicious, then forget about it. Like You're going to go out of business in no time. Do you tell them about this? No. No, and it's a conscious decision to not tell them. Like People respond badly, and I don't mean I'm generalizing. People respond badly to be told your, uh, what's it called, virtue signaling, where you say, like, oh, we're amazing, we're like zero waste. People don't respond well to that because it makes them feel bad about them not being that. So in spaces like this, I can, it's a safe space, I can talk about these things, you know, but to kind of, um, uh, to, 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 to overwhelm someone in their, uh, uh, time off, their luxury, money spent experience with your mission, you know, it's definitely like a no, a silo. I like have to train the staff not to be preachy, you know. We've had, we've had so many bad reviews for being preachy and we don't, and like even with this kind of like don't say anything <laughs> about what we do. Um, of course, if a customer comes and wants to know, we give them a tour, you know, we show them everything, and there's a lot of attention given if they, if they care. But yeah, not, 
not it's not part of our vocabulary. Good question. Um, we've got a new um, ice cream sandwich, which is the most zero waste dish that has ever existed. And it, it is set a new benchmark for zero waste. And it is um, the, it, it closes the, the loop on the whole menu. So the menu begins with bread and butter. And as I've told you, like we, we mill the flour. So from that, we have the bran. We sift out the thick outer part of the bran. And then, so that's a byproduct. And then we churn the butter. We have the buttermilk, which goes into like 10 other things. But there's so much buttermilk when you churn butter. You'll be amazed how much there is. This is like feeding it into all these different products. Anyway, we have a lot of buttermilk. Um, and then the bread itself, you bake more bread than you need. And so there's a lot of bread waste. So three waste ingredients from bread and butter. How do we close the loop? We actually closed the loop recently and all of that effectively, not just like a token, like really effectively, um, into the final dessert. So it bookends the whole meal. It's an ice cream sandwich. The, the wafer, the, the kind of biscuity wafer, is made with the uh, bran. So we use bran. We toast it with uh, salt, brown butter, and egg white. Egg white is another byproduct of uh, a, a, an egg dish that we have. So we're using that, closing that loop on egg whites. Going into this, um, it tastes like salt popcorn because you, you roast it with this brown butter and salt and it's delicious. Chewy, crispy, um, thin wafers made from bran. The buttermilk, we turn into dulce de leche and then that gets turned into dulce de leche buttermilk ice cream. And then, so that's sandwiched together in this kind of perfect wheel. And then the marmite you saw, we make marmite with no sugar, but then add, uh, make it a sh uh, like a Marmite syrup. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's crazy. It's like we, we now leave the Marmite out for three days to get a bit of fermentation, a bit of acidity. So then when you reduce it, you have this savory, salty, umami Marmite, but it has this brightness to it. And then you make it into a syrup, which glazes over the ice cream sandwich. And it's absolutely knockout. It is not, it's just amazing. So yeah, that's um, what is on the menu last night. Uh, green renewable from a company called Octopus. It's we just converted, but yeah. Yeah, like it's all trial and error. You can only like kind of, you know, feel like mm, I think it's going to be this. And the goalposts are like, you know, um, yeah, you just do it. And then if it doesn't work, I, I think that 90 percent of all these radical innovations we tried have died miserably. There's a lot of failure. There's a lot of failure in this restaurant. There has been in Brighton. It was like, I don't know how Brighton survived as a business. You know, as a business owner, if 90% of what you do is a failure, that's not good business. Um, it's not quite, that's not the truth. You know, 90% of the innovation, which was found outside of the, the regular, my regular working hours is what to do with the glass, what to do with this, and trying to innovate all these waste materials or byproducts within the system. And I've spent a lot of hours thinking outside the box about how to close the loop. But there's been a phenomenal amount of failure. So much so that I've got such a sensitivity to what will and won't work. I can almost, I call it the efficiency radar. And I can like scan what people are doing in the kitchen. And I just have this like red or green, green representing this is done. I can just sense that it's been done efficiently or if it's inefficient. And it's the same with the preparation of food or just simply if someone pitched an idea, oh, I've got this zero waste idea, I immediately know if it will or won't work because I've failed so many times. Um, and you learn better by failing. Yeah. And there was one more, should we do one more question? That's. How do you find stuff which carries the passion? That, that what? 
I don't know. How do we? How, do, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. How did you? How did you find us? Yeah. Yeah. It's the Gen Zs. It's the Gen Z. You're not quite Gen Z, are you? Gen Z is 2000 and onwards. You're not born. You're born in the night, like. So you are a Gen Z. <laughs> so it's the Gen Zs. They care about it. They're really into it. Um, not that I think Noah, you you and there's a last called Sky are the only Gen Zs that have ever worked at Silo. Um, but yeah, the 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 people that have the same values, the people that see what we're doing and 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 somehow connect to it. They there's a resonance. There's a, a feeling that like I connect to that, and then they just come. We do have. Um, it's 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 quite crazy now, like the, the the waiting list of people trying to to work for Silo because they believe that it's the future. Yeah. All right, it's time to uh, to have a glass of wine or a beer. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>